Trump's telling me put a call into Mr. Trump himself. It must have worked. It's all good. Let me read this to you. It's from Matthew 11. It said, John, meanwhile, had been locked up in prison. When he got wind of what Jesus was doing, he sent his own disciples to ask, are you the one we've been expecting or are we still waiting? And Jesus told, him, told them, go back and tell John what's going on. The blind see, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed. Do you hear that? People that are being pushed out are being cleansed. The deaf hear, the dead are raised, the wretched of the earth learn that God is on their side. Is that what you're expecting? Then count yourselves most blessed. The best news I recognize when I read a passage of scripture like that is that Jesus is still doing those things on the earth today. And the best news about that is including us in on the process. So we get to come into a house like this, lift up our praise, lift up a shout of the the very thing that's coming out of the inside of us. We get to join together and say, thank you, God, that you not only did that for us, but you included us in on it. Come on, let's give Him praise this morning.
Oh, we bless your name today, Father God. I'm thankful that he is alive, that he is alive in our hearts. Oh, and because he is alive, we are alive also. Come on, let's just worship him in this place today.
even in this place, just lift our hands to him today and just thank him because he has breathed his life into us today. And because we now have his life in our lungs, we can breathe it out to the world. Oh, we bless your name today, God. We've come in this place to worship you and you alone, Father. You are beautiful.
our hearts, hands, whatever we have open, let's leave it open right now. Because here's what I hear from the Lord this morning, is that He is overwhelming. What, a, what an amazing and, and deep song that we just sang. It's, a, it's what the Bible calls a Selah. It's a Selah song. Because God is way more amazing than we're conscious of a lot of times. And so we have to take a minute every once in a while. That's why the book of Psalms is there. We have to take a minute every once in a while and go, wait a minute. Life is overwhelming? Give me a break. God is overwhelming. His spirit is overwhelming. All these pressures all around me, man, they're overwhelming. No, no, no. You don't understand. God is overwhelming. He has no rival. He has no equal in your life today. Your consciousness, your awareness this morning may be so wrapped up in your week that you're missing the fact that the true overwhelming one is here to overwhelm that that overwhelms you. Do you feel him? Whew, do you feel him? He's here to overwhelm that that's overwhelming to you. He wants that word back. It don't belong to your issues. He wants that word back. It doesn't belong to your problems. It belongs to him. He's the overwhelming one here today. He's the over overwhelming one the overwhelming one is in you so you're never overwhelmed say la say la some of you you got an issue you got you got some junk in your life and it's not overwhelming here in his presence the lord is able to redeem and restore and heal in ways that overwhelm that overwhelming thing. Will you give it to him? Some of you need to see that big wave coming from the area out in the ocean. You need to see that big wave and not run from it. Just let his spirit overwhelm you right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I overwhelm those overwhelming life things. We take your word back, God, and we say you're the overwhelming one. You're the powerful one. You're the unforgettable one. Some of you have issues in your past and you go, I just can't get past it. It's unforgettable. Listen, he's unforgettable. He is unforgettable. He is overwhelming. Open your heart to the overwhelming one today and let him do things in the midst of this worship time. Do let him do things in the midst of the ministry today. Just allow the wave to overtake you because he's overwhelming your overwhelming situations today. Amen. Let's worship the Lord this morning. It's amazing. It's amazing what he's able to do.
thank him for what he does in our lives. Father, we just bless you today and we say we are overwhelmed by your goodness, by your grace, by how glorious that you are. So God, I just ask that as we've committed our hearts to you today, Father, God, that our worship continue to just permeate atmospheres that we walk into, God. But God, may it always come from a heart of pure gratitude that we are so thankful. Thank you for where you've brought us from, but thank you for where you're taking us to. We bless you today. And all God's people said, amen and amen. Can you just love on the people right next to you there? Let them know how awesome it is to get to be in church with them this morning. Don't let anybody go without a hug or a handshake. are ready to be dismissed. Originally, there was a pool party scheduled for today, but it has been moved to September the 10th. So make sure, parents, that you are uh, making sure to bring their bathing suits with them to go to Pastor Pat's on September the 10th. There will be a pool party. Early childhood, you guys are dismissed too. Hey, buddy. Good to see you. Early childhood, you guys are dismissed as well. We're going to have an amazing day today. It's already been incredible. Hey, good morning. Like Steph said, I'll, I'll be the first to tell y'all how awesome it is to be in this house worshiping with all of y'all this morning. It's really great. Today's a monumental service. It is, I guess, the last service in this house. And that's, that's, that's a good thing. It's also, I guess... If I think this through, this will be the last Sunday that will be a vagabond church. I, I guess we will have a home. We will expound upon that home and grow from it, but, but uh, we will be able to land again, and I'm very thankful for that. Having said that, we're coming around the corner. This is the last week. And in conversation with Pastor Kevin this morning, in just a matter of about three minutes, he said, there's no room for error this week. <laughs> there's this game day every day for it all to come together. So before we take up our offering this morning, I want everybody to commit that all through this week, every single day, every time you think about it, every time the Holy Spirit lays it upon your heart to pray for the finishing of this project. Can I get an amen from everybody on that? Everything come together as it's supposed to. Miraculous things happening. Does anybody, we'll get this took out of the way first. Does anybody need a, an offering envelope? Let's go ahead and do that. Ah, I can see you now. How about that? Just raise your hand if you need one. If you need an offering envelope, you can put your information on there. Pam very faithfully keeps track of that for you. For the end of the year tax time, if you want to give by text this morning, you can do that by 84321. Also on our app, which is on your smartphone, or by the website if you want to do it during the course of the week when you're at home or at your office. Right as we turn to last Sunday, before we move into our new new home, we're right about it. And I've thrown some I've thrown some monstrous figures out to you as we've gone along, but we're right at $89,500 to, that sounds a lot better than the 247 or 249 I started with, remember? You know, the Bible says, give and it shall be given back unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. It said, well, men give unto your bosom for with the same measure that you meet with all will be given right back to you. So this congregation has a lot a blessing coming its way for your faithful and sacrificial giving as we've gone going into our new house. And eighty nine thousand is two words if you're put writing it on your check. No hyphen. 
Is everybody as excited as I am? So let's get ready to give and let's pray. How about that? Father, I thank you so much. I thank you for the time that we've had in this, in this place. I thank you that your spirit, as we've been here, has brought blessing to this house. And this house, I say, will never be the same again because we've been here and because you've been here with us. And I pray that blessing throughout this place as the day is going forward and everything that it does, that it will always remember the habitation that you had here through Expression Church. Father, I thank you for every giver in this house. I thank you for the tither. I thank you for the sower. I pray, Father, a special blessing today as we're getting ready to leave this place. This giving will be a monument, Father, that you will remember that you will bless these people through the windows of heaven, that you will give them protection, bless their families, bless their businesses, bless their health and their households. Father, we just bring these gifts to you to honor you, to help your word and your purpose and plan for us to go forward in this tri-state area. So, Father, I just thank you for that. And all my family in this congregation says amen. Amen. Well, be blessed as you're giving. This is the last time we'll have a regular service, if we ever may have a special service here sometime or another down the road. It'll be way down the road. Next week, we'll be in one, at 115 Cheshire Way, Commerce Park. We, have, uh, we, we did our preliminary walkthrough last week with the inspectors, and uh, we have a punch-out list, which we, we called them in for that list, and now we're uh, ready to knock that out this week, and then I think they'll be back Wednesday or Thursday for the final and give us our occupancy permit. You know, we, yeah. Um, I think Barry just said our number is 89.5 to get the occupancy permit. Really what it boils down to is work has been completed uh, based on terms, uh, you know, net 5, net 10, pay as, you, as we complete it. We didn't stop the work. So bottom line is uh, uh, 89,500 takes care of all of the contractors um, on our end that we've been uh, working with to uh, um, pay them on the work that they went ahead and did based on getting us, in the occup getting us an occupancy permit. So um, they took a step of faith. We took a step of faith, and somewhere we're going to have to meet right at the place of writing a check. Uh, I saw a meme yesterday that said, I used to worry about what people thought about me until I realized I couldn't pay my bills with their opinions. And uh, isn't that true? You gotta, it takes money. And um, so anyway, with that said, we're thankful for what the Lord is doing and where he's going. And I said it, I think, four or five times back there. I'm feeling lots of pressure this week. I've been feeling it for months, but really a lot of pressure this past week. Um, we have really zero room for error this week. Everything has to be completely coordinated. Uh, Steph has done an incredible job of synchronizing all of this and coordinating all this. And it really is a, it's about a year-long construction project that we started uh, sometime in really end of February, 1st of March. So uh, it's a year-long project that we've crammed in five months. And uh, every contractor said the same thing. You guys are just, this is, it's not going to happen. Okay, let's just keep working because we believe it will. And uh, the, the, one of the greatest uh, accomplishments that I saw happen the, this past week was, was the Lord all the way was there's a, you guys saw the beam that ran through the sanctuary that really kind of came down pretty far and it was kind of an eyesore and um, they said for that beam uh, to be raised it's, it was going to be $50,000 and $10,000 for the engineering and 40000 for the contractor to come in and raise that beam. And we talked to several people, uh, engineering, most people, engineers wouldn't touch it um, uh, just because it's, you know, it's a risk of um, construction. And uh, Todd from, um, that's from Huntington Steel, um, Todd Wilson, he is, him and Rachel are uh, directors of our Supernatural School of Ministry and uh, ordained through here, um, incredible people. Todd works at Huntington Steel. So one of the engineers um, did some work for us. We had several people kind of uh, working. Um, that beam was raised this past week. 
by a couple of uh, three, four, five guys that just looked. If you would, we we filmed it, and we probably won't play it on YouTube until we get in and get an occupancy permit. Um, just because, if you would have seen, it was a ten thousand pound beam that was being raised by a ten thousand pound forklift, one, and they raised that thing, and you should have seen them. I mean, it was incredible, and our materials that we have in it was $900. It's a far cry from 50000 in it. Everybody jumped in. We're going we're gonna to give accolades and, and thank yous to when we get into the new property of all the different contractors, and you know, we're going to have a moment to kind of celebrate all of them and the companies that they work for and companies that they dealt with that really stepped up and helped us get there. So our goal is... Uh, this week. We will not have parking lot complete by Sunday, uh, but we'll have something there uh, for us to be able to, you know, not have a mud hole and all that, and then parking won't be very long after that. So we're, we're meeting with the parking people, uh, somebody today actually, uh, this evening, to uh, try to get something worked out between now and next week. So uh, keep that in prayer. Um, painting is Stacy Shannon's painting company is moving forward. Um, it's just there's a lot of good things that are happening. So uh, I'll be glad to get there so we can build a body. For the last several months, you know, it's just been, every, it seems like everything's in transition. You know, it's hard to focus when you're, you get wore out, you get tired when you're in transition. And after a while, you, transition becomes like a steady place. And you learn to think transition is the way it's supposed to be. And you kind of just settle in for transition. And you go, gosh, I feel like I've been in transition for five years. Well, we feel like we have. It'll be four years in September, we started this church and I feel like it's just been, we were good at 18th Street for about a year and a half. And then when we sold that property, outgrew it, we moved, and now we've been, you know, working. The City Hall, the City of Huntington has been, you know, Maxine, all of the team here have been incredible to us. Uh, so I would like for you to give them a, a, a round of applause and a thank you for... They have been incredibly accommodating, and um, so we're thankful uh, for, for them and what they've done for us as we've been transitioning and coming through here. And, uh, of course, you know, she owes us a little thank you, too. They've raised over $300,000 since we've been in here, outside donors bringing people here, I believe because the anointing is here. All right? So um, allow me to take, uh, for us to take credit for that for the anointing, all right, because it's just... That had, she said it hadn't happened in 20 some years, that kind of you know, fundraising and giving. Um, so we're thankful for what the Lord is doing. I think for the gifts this past week, somebody texted me out of the blue and said I was praying, and the Lord spoke to me clearly to give $20,000. And uh, I didn't question it one second. I said, I think you heard exactly what the Lord said. <laughs> and, and, that, and what happens is the beginning of those, when people are obedient and step out like that, it creates obedience and faith in other people. It's not emotional giving, it's spiritual giving. And uh, emotions are involved, but, you know, because sometimes fear grips you when you the Lord tells you what to give. And it just does. But I, I sense that we're probably uh, kind of leading a little bit of the way, and I'm looking forward to getting down there where we can build a healthy group of people. And, uh, you know, we're always going to be in transition in life somewhere, but when life is just total transition, it's just hard. You get tired. And then when you get tired and weary, you know, your mind starts getting played with, and you start having, you know, crazy things start happening. And um, then you, you start going, my gosh, and here's, what, here's how it works. Am I in the will of the Lord? I mean, God, you know, do, do, are we supposed to be? And you start questioning and doubting even things that you were so certain of six months before. And that's the trick of the enemy is to get you to move off of what you know the Lord had told you. Uh, because if you haven't, if you're not seeing what you saw, you have to keep going. Because what you saw over here in your vision may not be what you're seeing at the moment, but you never lose sight of what you saw just because of what you're seeing. You got to keep going. And um, you outlast the trouble. You'll, the trouble will get tired of getting troubled. The trouble will be troubled by you if you just keep moving and keep pressing in, if you don't get weary and you're well doing. And then occasionally when you fly off with the flesh, like I did a little about 20 minutes ago before church started, you get all fleshly, you get mad. You say something you shouldn't have said. Well, thank God for grace and mercy. Right? Look at y'all going, you did? Yeah, I did. I was talking to one of the contractors. I said, you said Thursday. 
He said, I said today. I said, you said Thursday. It'll be done today. He said, I knew I had a couple extra days. I said, but in my mind, you didn't. Blankety, blank, blank, blankety, blank, blank in my head. I didn't say it out loud. No, he's a good friend, and he thought he had a couple extra days, but what's happened, I was practicing because we have Monday through Saturday, and we have no room for error. It's got to come right on you. It's got to, it's got to click. So you can be nice and everybody like you, or you can say, we got to get it done, and then you'll like you at the end. Caden does not like me when I jump in and try to help him clean his room, but when that room's clean, he's pretty thankful. Matter of fact, he can't stand me during the process. But after it's clean, you know what I'm talking about? You just, I did not like football practice. He doesn't either. But yesterday's game when they were playing made Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday worthwhile for him. He hated those two-hour practices in 90-degree weather, getting yelled at by the coach. But yesterday, they had a good game. And when they played well, he realized that playing well on, on Saturday didn't result because of playing well on Saturday. It was because they came and sacrificed and, and practiced Monday through Friday as a team, disciplining themselves and learning, and it pays off. That's what life is. So when you're faced with a challenge and God gives you an opportunity to be promoted or progress in life, it's the little things you do in life that make you ready for the big things. Right? It's what's happening with the country right now. Everybody's looking for something big to happen when we really need to just start focusing on those little things we need to be doing right. Do you know in Ashland last night or Catlinsburg, they caught the jail on fire? And the fire started on the inside. Did you see that? Inmates felt like they didn't have enough water. It was not getting what they needed. And they set a fire on the inside. Because they needed, they needed something. Now they had to relocate all those uh, the inmates to other jails. You don't know when they're going to get them back in there. You got things happening in Orlando. You got things happening in Boston. You got things happening all over the country. There's, there's, there's peaceful demonstrations. There's wild demonstrations. There's all kinds of things happening because there's something on the inside of people that are looking for something bigger than themselves, right? It's, it's, it's crazy times. And the reason we're building a church is so we can sit up and build a church and sit on our laurels down there and feel like, well, look what we've done. God, you've been good to us and set up a museum down there. We're going to attract some people from Ashland that's going down there and radically transform that city. We're going to hit the streets. Gonna, you know what I mean? We're not going to rely on what other people are actually out here doing to come in and build a, a crowd so we can say, God, look what we've done. No, we're going to, I'm looking for some authentic outreach. Somebody that walks through the, the halls. See, it's easy to walk through the hood and try to find people that are in a mess. Walk through here and get a prophetic word that somebody in here is in, a, in an adulterous affair and the Lord speaks to you and tells you that you need to stop in that office right there and, and encourage them. Oh, looking at me like I'm crazy. Oh, we can go to the down and out because it's easy to spot. But the same spirit that speaks to you in that moment should be the same spirit that speaks to you in any moment. Raise up people, hear the voice of God. Know what to do in the times we're living in. Mature, grown up, kids, young people walking through the halls of Huntington High and Cabell Midland and wherever else that they're going, in middle school, walking through the halls and just say, I just heard the Lord say. And everybody just stops and listens to what the Lord said. People hear what the Lord is saying. Not what is CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, and Nickelodeon, and all the other channels telling us what the Lord's saying. What are, what's the Lord saying through you? How can you change your little microcosm of the world? Right? It's going to take different kind of thinking. It's going to take a different kind of being. And, 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 you, and sometimes God moves you and turns you completely around and picks you up and plants you where you can get rooted in a place, a city, a town, and you're there for a season. He picks you up and moves you over here or a school or a, or a profession, whatever it might be, and you're moving around. But the Lord is moving you, and he does that on purpose because at that point he's trying to get something in you, but he's also trying to get you in something else or in them. So it's going to take a different kind of thinking. It's just the way it works. You have to abandon your old thoughts of the way church has been 
because the world has already abandoned the way the world has already been. They're not thinking like now, like it used to be 10 years ago. Do you know the world, for them to be so radical in their expression of what they're feeling, so radical, they really believe what they're doing is gonna make a change. So the last thing we can be as a church world is to sit over here and evaluate what they're doing and not really engage in what he's called us to do. Right? Hmm? If the church is transitioning, see, there's, there's, there's times in history that time has brought, and it takes a different kind of leadership, different kind of mindset, different kind of paradigm every kind of thought process that changes and accelerates people into to destiny and changes culture and moves it into the way it's supposed to be. It just takes that kind of thought process. And once somebody points it out, you, everybody can kind of lock into it, but it takes somebody to be a, a forerunner or a visionary like John the Baptist was. John the Baptist was the son of a priest. He wasn't in the temple, but he was down in the Jordan River in the wilderness. He was down there doing priestly things, but it just wasn't like the priestly was, do, was doing in, the, in the, the temple. So he, he, he wasn't forfeiting his role. He was just doing it differently than they've already known. Because why? There was something about ready to change because Jesus was showing up on the scene. And the church today is programmed for the sky to be split, and he, and he is coming. There's no question. He's coming. But while, while we're waiting on the rescue, the world is dying, but so is the church, waiting on the rescue. And we're like in quicksand holding our hand up going, somebody get me out of this mess as we just continue to sink lower and lower and lower. And occasionally you get your second wind and get a reach back, but nothing happens and nothing long lasting and sustaining happens. So you were going, what in the world? And so... Then we, 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 we're planted in a place, and we're here, we're in it for a season, and then we think that, God, I'm waiting on you to do something, waiting on you to do something. The Lord says, I'm just waiting on you to do something. I'm really just waiting on you. And you say, but I know I'm supposed to be here, and you're going to change this, you're going to change this job, you're going to change this company, these people are going to change. And what I've learned in my life, whether it be right or wrong, this is how I see it, is sometimes we wait much longer than we should have waited. And the best thing to do is take a leap. Well, we're waiting on this or that. It could be this is that. Right? See, think about this. If one of the major changes and applications that the world is going to see that's going to be a remedy of the drug culture and all the different things that are happening in the world our economic boost, then if people don't create jobs, then we're not gonna provide the solution or part of the solution for the, some of these problems people are having. So rather than wait for Steel of West Virginia or Huntington Steel or AK Steel or some of the plants to start growing and, and, and hiring people, I'm asking you, in your time of transition, what is he telling you to start? I'm a firm believer that every kid that graduates high school should own their own company, even if they're their own self-employed person, just to learn how the world works. Not that you don't, can't be a, an employee, but you gotta know how an employer thinks if you're ever gonna be a good employee. Here's what I'm feeling today. I don't even feel like preaching a sermon. I really don't. Here's what I'm feeling. Let me just tell you where I am. The church has been secluded over here in praying for people to get healing, pray for people to get delivered, pray for people to get saved, pray for people, and that is obviously a major focus of what we should do. But while we're doing that, this, the world and the culture of the world is being created by people that are not over there, and then we have to come out of our world when we aren't seeing these things happen like we thought they would, come over here and subject ourselves to over here 
while we're still praying for things to change over there. And I'm not so sure that we shouldn't be over here creating these things while we're doing those things over there and over here. I'm not so sure that healing doesn't have to happen just on a Sunday. It could happen on a Monday. I, I, I'm just not so sure. And I'm also not sure that while we're waiting on healing for 15 years and it hasn't happened, that we can still come over here and engage in culture and see some change take place. Because I don't have all the answers of why things aren't working the way they should be working. But I will know this, that there's an aggressive nature that's rising up in the world system. Listen, it used to be planes they're shooting down. You can't take their driver's license. Now they're running up on sidewalks and killing people. I heard a guy say the other day, he said, what we're gonna do now, he said, they're gonna have to start having barriers, concrete barriers, all across the place. So it'll keep people safe when they're in crowded public areas, so it keeps people from driving off. And, and that'll work until they find another way. You see what I'm saying? The, the, the best thing to do is we're not gonna stop all of that, but we're teaching people how to live in fear and, and defense trying to get into the mind of a crazy person. So we're putting all of our laws and regulations in ways to keep us off the defense. How about we just raise up some crazy, radical, offensive people that are on our side? You see what I'm talking about? I'm not talking about just tit for tat and fighting and all that. I'm talking about somebody that just stands up and says, for me and my house, we're gonna serve the Lord. I'm, I'm tired of being shaped by all of this. It's going to take a different kind of thinking. I want to play something on video. Steph, would you come up here for a second? I want you to set this, this video up real quick. And I want to play this, and then I want to take this just for a moment, and then we're going to... I'm not going to be long. Set this video up, if you don't mind. Can you hear me now? All right. The video or the uh, song that's going to be played, there's a large Broadway play out right now that it's extremely hard and almost impossible to get tickets to. It's called Hamilton. And it's one of the largest and most uh, successful Broadway plays in decades. And it's kind of taken the whole uh, New York stream and also it's made its way into different places. But it's about the founding of our country. And it's told through the perspective of the first... Um, Treasury Secretary Alexander Hamilton. And what you're fixing to hear, the whole play tells the story of a young immigrant that comes to the country and finds himself uh, in with a lot of different people making his way up to become the first U.S. Treasury Secretary. And he is George Washington's right-hand man and how they have now fought in the war together. They've won and now they are building a country because how many of you all know it's one thing to start something sustaining it is a completely different thing mm -hmm. so what they are now doing is they are setting up different systems and processes together of how, of things that we now flow in every single day as a country and it's been now that George Washington has just had an amazing amazing term it was incredible and they actually wanted George Washington to stay even more but he recognized that everything this is George Washington he recognized that he was setting a precedence for from for centuries on that he was setting the standard for what presidents would flow in and he recognized that a good president also knew how to lead and how to go forward but he also knew when his season was over so what you're fixing to hear is the conversation between George Washington and Alexander Hamilton as he's getting ready to tell him some pretty big news that's coming up and Alexander Hamilton was an enemy they were on the same team Jefferson 
Thomas, Thomas, Je Thomas Jefferson actually was one of the ones who, um, he believed one thing, it was one of those things, if you had, he was the first Secretary of State with George Washington's cabinet. He was the first Secretary of State. Alexander Hamilton was the first Treasury Secretary, and they were constantly at odds with one another, constantly. And uh, Hamilton was always taking cheap shots at Thomas Jefferson, and Thomas Jefferson was doing the same to Alexander Hamilton. So you could have, it would be like this, on the same team, wanting the same goal, but a different way to get there. Their personalities got involved. They kind of, you know, had their own agendas, and, but they were on the same team. It, in the church world, it would be like your Pentecostals fighting your Methodists or your Baptists fighting your Catholics. And you're, you see what I'm talking about? All on the same team, but yet you're going, well, they don't have what you have. Their motivation is not right. They're, and it brings schisms within the, the body. But, so everything that you were fighting for now is at risk. Why? Because I see it one way and you see it another. But here's the deal. When they were all fighting to establish the nation, it really didn't matter what everybody else thought. You couldn't bring your preference in when you're fighting to, to gain the victory. Preferences come in when you go to sustain long term and build systems in, in, to enrich people's lives. That's when people begin to go, hmm, I think it ought to be this way. I think it ought to be this way. Well, I like what they say, but I don't like what they say. Right? And before you know it, you get caught up in the personalities and you forget why you did what you did to begin with. You know what I'm talking about? So the reason I'm showing you this today is because we've been building. We've been contending. We've been fighting. Not us, just us, the whole country. So it's going to take a different kind of leadership. A, a leader and leadership that puts our personal agendas and our personal thoughts and submit them to the whole. What is the big picture's reward? Go ahead. Mr. President, you asked to see me. I know you're busy. What do you need, sir? Sir? I want to give you a word of warning. Sir, I don't know what you heard, but whatever it is, Jefferson started it. Thomas Jefferson resigned this morning. You're kidding. I need a favor. Whatever you say, sir, Jefferson will pay for this behavior. Talk. Less. I'll use the press, I'll write under a pseudonym You'll see what I can do to him I need you to draft an address Yes, he resigned, you can finally speak your mind no. He's stepping down so he can run for president ha! Good luck defeating you, sir I'm stepping down, I'm not running for president I'm sorry, what? One last time Relax, have a drink with me One last time Let's take a break tonight And then we'll teach him how to say goodbye To say goodbye You and I No, sir, I why? want to talk about neutrality Sir, with Britain and France on the verge of war Is this the best I want to warn against partisan fighting what? Pick up a pen, start writing I want to talk about what I have learned The hard-won wisdom I have earned Concerned, you have to serve. You could continue to serve. One last time, the people will hear from me. One last time, and if we get this right, we're gonna teach them how to say goodbye. You and I. Mr. President, they will say you're weak. under their own vine and fig tree and no one shall make them afraid they'll be safe in the nation we've made I want to 
want to sit under my own vine and fig tree a moment alone in the shade at home in this nation we've made one last time one last time though in reviewing the incidents of my administration I am unconscious of intentional error. I am nevertheless too sensible of my defects not to think it probable that I may have committed many errors. I shall also carry with me the hope that my country will view them with indulgence and that after 45 years of my life dedicated to its service with an upright zeal, the faults of incompetent abilities will be consigned to oblivion as I myself will soon be. To the mansions of rest. I anticipate with pleasing expectation that retreat in which I promised myself to realize the sweet enjoyment of partaking in the midst of my fellow citizens. The benign influence of the good laws of the free government, the ever favored object of my heart, and the happy reward as I trust of our mutual care. Labors and dangers. One last time. George Washington's going home. Teach him how to say goodbye. George Washington's going home. Jesus has his disciples all gathered around him. He told them for three and a half years, I must die. I've got to die on that cross. I've come for one purpose, that is to remove all the sins from mankind. I've come just to take it all away from you. I've come to have you can have life and have that life more abundantly. You've been living underneath this cloud of this pressure of life. And every time you thought you were going to do okay, and you think one step ahead, get ahead, something's going to knock you back and tuck you back two or three steps. Just when you think you're making progress, ah, oh, here it comes again. Somebody comes in and condemns you, or you make a mistake, and you feel full of shame and guilt. And before you know it, you've got to start all over again. For three and a half years, he kept telling them, I'm taking all that away from you. That way you don't have to start over every time. What happens is when you make a mistake, you just get right back up and you keep right on going. Why? Because you just got to keep on moving. The, the mistake is the last time. It's not your first time. And you don't have a world ahead of you that's just full of heartaches and hardships and pressures and no, 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 no. I'm coming to take it all away. But here's the problem. Guys, I've got to die for this to happen. And I'm going to take it up all myself. Every sin you could possibly think, every guilt, every condemnation, your shame, all your, your things that you could have done, would have done, should have done, and thought you might have done, I'm putting it all on me. That way nobody can look at you and say, you are, you did, you shouldn't have, you can't. No, no, I'm taking it all away. But I got to go away. I'm leaving here. Peter looks at him and says, Jesus, my God, we've been following you for three and a half years. We listened to your message. We believe this. We've abandoned all. We've seen 5,000 people fed with two fish and five loaves. We've seen People raised from the dead. We see Lazarus come forth out of a, a, an empty or a tomb and they unraveled him with the grave clothes and he began to walk and he ate with you the next day. We've seen some stuff, Jesus. We've seen ears put back on. We've seen people raised. We've seen the little girl raised from the dead. We've seen virtue flow out of your, the hem of your garment and a woman with the issue of life, the, the issue of blood was healed after 12 years. We've seen a man with 38 years that, a, that was crippled and he got, we've seen it all and now you're telling us you got to go away. He said, you don't understand how it works. If I don't go away, the heart of what I am will never get in you. You'll always look for me when I'm giving you me now. I'm 
going to pour into you my vision. I've shown you how it works. I've given you my intentions. I've given you my thoughts, my dreams, my prayers towards you. But you want me to stay here and it doesn't work that way. I've got to teach you how to be independent, but also reliant on me. I have more confidence, guys, in what I'm giving you than you have in what you're receiving. I need you to know that when I put my heart inside of you, I'm not taking it back. I'm not changing my mind. See, the problem with you, Peter, James, and John, and the rest of you, you know when the season begins, but you don't know when the season ends. You hang around for too long. You want me to stay here one more day? You just say, if I could just be around one more year. No, you got to know when the season ends. You'll know when it begins because it'll be very easy to spot, but do you stay around just a little too long? I'm going to pour into you guys my heart, my spirit, and the things that you've seen me do Oh, you'll do those, but you'll do it that much greater. But here's the thing. I don't want you to stay and do it just amongst the two or three of you. I went out amongst the people. I went in places that nobody would go. Do you remember me talking to the Samaritan woman at the well? You guys looking at me from a distance saying, why is he talking to this woman that's a half-breed outcast? We're not supposed to be talking to them. And you saw me talking to her. I want you to go to her. I want you to go to the ones that nobody will go to. But when you get summoned up in front of the king, don't act like you don't belong in front of the king. When you get invited to the wedding at the governor's place for his family, act like you belong. I don't want you looking for the high and the elite and forgetting the poor, but I don't want you just to attract yourself to the poor and forgetting the high and elite. I've demonstrated my walk to you. You've gone everywhere that I've gone. And you still want me to stay. I'm going to tell you one last time. I want you to get inside of your head. And I want you to teach and make disciples out of everybody you come in contact with. And I want you to teach them not only about me but I want to teach want you to teach them of me. What's the difference, Jesus? It's easy to tell them about it. No, but when you teach them of me, it applies to their life today. See, it's one thing talking about history, but what do you tell 237 inmates in Catlettsburg, Kentucky that feel like their civil rights are violated and they start a fire on the inside? Oh, I know what you can do. Let's take it back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and tell them about the woman with the issue of blood that came and, and they just touched the hem of the garment. You gotta just press in of prayer and fasting. No, there's 237 over here that can't relate to what you're saying. But we can quote them Philippians 2, 19 and we can give them Acts 2, 14 and we, we can give them, oh, yeah, you can do all of that, but I gotta know that you're instant in season and you're instant out of season. I got to know that when I walk away from here, that I don't have to come back again and show you and rescue you out of here. I'm leaving you here to, to set up and put justice and mercy where justice and mercy needs to be. Things that are set up high, I want you to bring them down low. Things that are low, I want you to raise them up high. Things that are crooked and out of joint, I want you to bring them, make them, make them smooth. And sometimes things that are smooth need to be churched and changed and crooked and out of joint. How am I going to know to do that, Jesus? How's that going to work? I am placing my wisdom and my revelation and my spirit inside of you. So when I go, I will come into you and you will be fully equipped with the spirit of heaven living inside of you. The minute you detach yourself from the spiritual heaven and the spiritual father and the spiritual climate of what I'm talking about, 
It'll be the best that you can fend for. But the more you're reliant, you become on that spirit, the more you're able to see it through spiritual eye. So when things come at you and you, life disappoints you, when you're looking through the spirit, you say, it don't end that way. I was dealt a blow, but the blow can't take me out. I lost everything, but I know that didn't everything, so I've gotta get back more than I lost. Why? Because you're looking at it through a lens that I've been sharing with you for three and a half years. I don't need to stay here and explain it to you and give you a commentary and a narrative. I'm trusting you that what you're getting from me gives you life and that life more abundantly. And Peter, what I want you to do on that day of Pentecost, I want you to stand up and I want you to summons everybody and tell them something ended and something just began. See, that way, Peter, they're not gonna be afraid of death because there can't be a death without a life. There can't be an ending without a beginning. There can't be a last without a first. So when they see them losing things, they must be gaining others. When they see the finality of a, a season coming to a close, they'll see a, an opening to something brand new. Give them hope, Peter. Give them a future, Peter. I gotta go away. George Washington looked at Alexander Hamilton and said, could I win this election? You better believe it. No different than Jesus saying, could I stay here three more years, heal lots of people? Oh, you better believe it. But it's necessary I go away so I can come into you and the things that I've done, you will do and greater. Washington said, listen, we fought. We set it up. It's here. The framework is established but we're not building this for the next term. We're not building it for the next two terms. We're building it for those that have not even yet been born yet. They're in the loins and in the heart of the father that their parents don't even know they even exist yet. That's what we're building. So, Hamilton, Peter, I'm willing to go away. So what's inside of me can rise. So we can go out and amongst the people. For four years, we have been on a journey. It's been an up and it's some been down. We've experienced lots of successes and we've experienced a few things that we can't explain. But the heart of who we are as a church, I pray, is the same heart that we just heard and we've been studying for the last four years. One that celebrates the traditions of what we've been through and carrying those forward for our children to remember that we'll look out over a city as we're driving down the city and hearing what happened in Boyd County and what Catlinsburg and what happens in Ohio and Kentucky and Boston, all over the world, and we don't get jaded and cynical. Then we realize, no. It's our time. It's your time to start that business. It's your time to close one down. It's your time to go back to school. It's your time to graduate. It's your time to buy that property. It's your time to sell one. It's your time to get rid of that car, give it away to somebody that needs it. You've been hanging on it, it's been sitting in your driveway for too long. You've been carrying your memories around. 
rather than build new ones. It's the best time to be alive. The Lord says over the next seven years, you're not to evaluate the next seven years over intervals of weeks or months. You're not gonna be able to look back and take a gauge right in the middle of the journey and say, this is a success or this is a failure. You'll look back seven years from now and say, I saw some ups and I saw some downs, but where I am in seven years from today will be much further than I've ever thought I'd ever be. You're gonna see the hand of the Lord. You're gonna see the hand of plenty. You're gonna see the hand of opportunity. You're gonna see the hand that's beckoning you to come. But you've gotta be willing to lay some things down and unlike it's been over the last decades of the church world, I'm not telling you to lay down what we call your sin. I'm talking about laying down what you've attached yourself to that's kept you focused and waited rather than embracing your future. You've been afraid of losing rather than risking to win. You've been hurt and damaged. But if you hadn't been hurt and damaged, you'd still be where you were, rotting away. You'd have stayed another 10 years thinking it was gonna change. And the Lord says, I couldn't let you waste 10 more years because you were loyal where you were. She was mistreating you, he was mistreating you. You were talked about, they were talking about you behind your back. No, all it did was prompt me to release me into where I'm headed. The Lord says, as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were known to the world, the seed and the inheritance from Abraham will be materializing in the lives of his people in the next seven years. country has shifted over the last several decades away from a blue collar America to a white collar America. And over those last several decades, greed entered in, even entered into the church over the last couple of decades. And the Lord says you're going to see policies and things change in the church in the culture to where the blue collar America is gonna shine again. And God's gonna raise up white collar that value and honor blue collar. Not look down on them as they're less than. God's piece in a body like a puzzle, snapping it together. Where the outer edges of the puzzle appreciate the guts of the puzzle. And the guts of the puzzle recognize the outer edges are necessary to find their place. And he's raising up architects, apostolic leaders and prophetic leaders across this land. Some are in the church world and some are in politics and some are in government and some are in corporate America. Some are in education. God's raising them up 
that are able to see blueprints from heaven, but are able to articulate it and see it come to pass in life. Coordination is gonna become more contemporary and quicker. Straightforwardness and truth being spoken, not talking about out of both sides of your mouth or wondering what people have to say, it's coming straight at you. Not to offend you, but to keep you going forward. Not to hurt you, but to keep you on task. Not to break relationships, but to fortify true relationships. You're gonna see it. You're gonna see it. You're gonna see it. You're gonna see the media turned upside down where they don't even know what they're writing or what they're saying. They're gonna talk out of both sides of their mouth and begin to say things they don't even have a clue what they're saying. And the truth is gonna seep right through that they cannot even say anything other than the truth because the truth's gonna speak for itself. The proof's gonna be in the pudding. It's not gonna be your favorite commentator. It's not gonna be your favorite person in your, 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 your news network. It's not gonna be your p favorite TV program or your favorite sports person. It's not gonna be about who's gonna honor the national anthem and the, the American flag. It's not gonna be about all that because there's raising up a group of people. Now you might not like what I'm about ready to tell you, but because change is not happening from the outside, God is raising on the hearts of the people. Oh God, I'm gonna get in trouble for this, but I'm telling you by the Spirit of the Lord. They started a fire on the inside of that jail out of rebellion, but it relocated every single one of them. I'm asking you as a body of believers, not to be in rebellion. I'm asking you, what are you gonna start on the inside of you that's gonna cause your relocation? When are you gonna start worrying about, oh, the things on the outside and I'm subject to this variable and that variable and that person and that person and you on the inside say, no, 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 no. Restrictions are gonna come off of me and I'm gonna reach down on the inside of me that says nothing is impossible for me. Your kids are waiting on you to take a step. They're going, come on, Dad. Come on, Mom. Come on, Grandma. Come on, Grandpa. Take that step. Leave us something better than we're seeing right now. Leave us something better. Give me something to work with. Get yourself up off of yourself. And you got to know, one last time, we're leaving this thing behind and we're moving on to the thing that God has before us. One last time, we're gonna raise up a George Washington that says, it's not about me, but it's about the big picture. We're gonna raise up the little the, 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 the people from Christ, Christians that follow after Christ and say, it's not about me, but it's about his big picture. I want to know where we are. Stand to your feet with me all over this place. Father, in Jesus' name, I declare to you, we stand before you as a representative, a small sample of your body across this entire world. We're not going to get caught up in what's happened on the right, from the right, or to the left, and from the left. We're gonna stay central focused, centered on you, what you're doing in our lives. God, raise us up to be who you've called us to be. Let us be with full of boldness and courage. Let us have the courage to cut off those things that are weaknesses in our life and embrace those things that are strong. We're headed somewhere. We commit to you those next seven years are gonna be the greatest seven years this world has ever seen. It'll be up and it'll be down, but at the end of the seven, we'll look back and say, I wouldn't trade this journey for any journey in the world. In Jesus' name, all of God's people that agree with us say amen. God bless you all.